and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Jennifer Holmgren, CEO, Lanza Tech. Mark Hutchinson, CEO, Fortescue Future Industries. Frederick Lisalde, President and CEO, Vogue Warner. Donna Thomas, journalist and New York Times bestselling author. Moderator, Patricia falco Becali, moderator and former journalist, Falco Global Partners. Some applause, thank you. Actually, that triggers me to say thank you, of course, Lorenzo Simonelli for the invitation, really. And thank you very much for making us feel like rock stars. I mean, Bianca, the, uh, the, the voice from God, really is making a really nice entrance for all of us. So today, right now, I think uh, it's been very interesting to see how energizing change can really be. And I think this is what we are looking at in this sustainability-focused session with our fantastic panel, because energizing change, and everybody goes like, oh no, but change out of my comfort zone, it means money, it means time, it means potential problems, but I think change is extremely energizing depending on your mindset. And what I have here is a panel that can show you a little bit from almost the abacus to today's algorithms, for example, in the automotive sector, where we have started, gone through, and perhaps also going in future. So time for action, how, and that is a key word here, how, Different industries are actually championing sustainability. And, Federic, I want to start with you, simply because we all know what a car is, we all have been using cars, and we have seen also the transition as consumers, what's actually been happening from a normal car, combustion engine, we are now driving computers that happen On the to wheel. have mm -hmm. wheels. So, Bok Warner, one of those very old supply companies of that sector, 130 years plus, you've come a long way. Tell us a little bit, so we, we are all a little bit on the same playing field. Right. What is it like, that sustainable path that you are going? So, maybe let's start with scope three, right? We've started about seven, eight years ago to really put the uh, foot on the, on the, on the metal on electrification of powertrain. And I, I didn't talk about battery electric vehicle, I talked about electrification of powertrain, which is much wider than just BEV. Um, we've invested uh, billions of dollars, we've, um, we closed eight acquisitions in the last four years. This year alone, half of our R&D is for e-products, when e-products is only 15% of our revenue. So it tells you how much we have charged forward. We call that the charging forward strategy. So the, what we do has uh, as required a lot of energy for change. Um, we've also spun, up, we also spun off a company last July that is focused on fuel management and hydrogen called Finair. Uh, it's listed now on the New York Stock Exchange because change needs focus. And at Borg Warner, we didn't feel that we could do combustion, hybrids, range extenders, electrification, electronics, but also fuel management and hydrogen, etc. across Pascal and CV. So we made the decision to really focus on what's core. Uh, so that's the what we produce, what the, the how we produce it is, is very important. And so we're focusing our um, 100 plants around the world in reducing scope one and two. We've pretty much reduced about 26% over the last 24 months, which is pretty astonishing. Uh, and doing it the, what I call the right way, meaning bottom up with real actions, not just buying carbon credits, right? Real actions meters, reuse, reusing the heat of machines, and, and um, buying green energy, and solar, and wind, and, and things like that. So it was a lot of fun and a lot of work over the past years. I think one of the key aspects you touched on is certainly charging forward. You are focused with a certain mission, and you put a lot of money towards it. I think uh, of your current revenues, 40 to 50% go into R&D, if I'm not mistaken, and you have certain financial goals. Now, 
to meet these goals in your corporation, mm -hmm. at, at the same time trying to meet the goals set also by the Paris Accord, for example. How difficult is it really on a day-to-day -day process level to get there? Yeah, I think what's very important is to align shareholder with the, with, with the company strategy. And to do that, uh, we made the conscious choice to just say what you're going to do and do what you said you would do. And if some shareholders don't want you to do what you said you would do, then they can go and buy other type of uh, stocks uh, and you want to attract the shareholders that are in line with your strategy, supporting the strategy, which is managing the present, be very, very focused on converting on the current sales, but also preparing the future with speed and focus. And how difficult was that, internally speaking? Excuse me? How difficult was it really to, to introduce the new strategy, put the minds to it, that was okay? Because the yeah. demand is out there, what was the push? It was, it was not that difficult. It was, uh, again, a question of focus, and that's what we've done for the past five years. So there are stuff that on purpose we didn't touch. Uh, and it was all about setting up the right product portfolio to be relevant whatever uh, type of energy is in use in mobility for Pascal commercial vehicle and everything else that moves and we'll with wheels. Yeah, and with wheels. And we'll talk about the different energy mix you actually have to offer also um, going forward. Dana. Yes. I love that you are here because thanks to my research going really into the rabbit hole of what the fashion industry is like, and here in our audience there's so many people in the energy business, of course, but fashion industry, fashion production, you know what? We should be sitting naked here, to be perfectly honest. Or wear, I don't know, edible Lululemons made from mushrooms, mycelium. It's incredibly dirty as an industry. Tell us a little bit about it. You wrote three books, really looking deep behind the scenes of what we wear. Well, it's interesting. We don't think about fashion as having an impact on environment and humanity, but it does. We, the fashion industry produces between 100 and 150 billion items every year. That's such a big range because nobody actually has a, reports how much they do. So it's a, you know, there's a long stretch between 100 and 150 billion. Of that, only 80% are sold. 20% are destroyed or sent to landfill before they ever even hit the retail floor. Now, that's a huge impact on, on everything from resources, cotton, water, earth, soil, transportation, that just gets chucked and doesn't even get used. Yes, in the you know, spreadsheet and economies of scale, it seems like it's good business, but in the long game, it's not. And that's the problem with the fashion industry. The link, of course, to uh, energy here and Baker Hughes is that two-thirds of our clothes today contain petroleum-based or fossil fuels-based materials, polyester, nylon, lycra, uh, neoprene. When you go surfing, the surfers are actually trying to find an alternative because they're upset that their neoprene leaks microfibers into the water where they spend all their time. But it's, it's not recyclable. It doesn't biodegrade. There's a few startups that are coming to regenerate polyester. There's one in Italy called Econeal that does regenerates nylon. But only 1%, 1% of our clothing and fashion and apparel is recycled every year. 1%. The rest of it's either destroyed or gets sent to landfill. And is now, or is sent to Africa, where it's now washing up on beaches because it just gets dumped in the sea because we don't know what to do with all these clothes. Yeah. You know, I have a teenage daughter. And fast fashion is something that is, you know, everyday kind of. These labels make us feel extremely rich when you are a uh, you know, teenager and everything just costs that and that and the other. And of course, things accumulate. So I can, can relate to that. But isn't they are also the point that the, the actual consumer here is asked to not only look at the price tag, but look beyond. Not always look for cheap and quick, but look for sustainable and maybe recycled. That mindset isn't there yet. No, that mindset isn't there yet. And there's two reasons why. Though it's coming stronger, one reason is because the fashion industry is the least regulated of the four big ones of agriculture, mobility, 
construction, fashion, apparel is an enormous business, nearly $1 trillion a year in sales. And it is one of the least regulated, though that's about to change, and we'll talk more about that. And because it's not regulated, therefore, they don't have to pass on this message. They don't really, nobody, it's like this thing, the subject nobody really talks about, because it's not really pretty, right? To say, you have to, you know, do you know that your clothes are polluting? No, yeah, we just want to look good. So uh, it's not really talked about, but it's changing. Uh, about half of consumers say that they want to support or look for brands that are sustainable when asked. And 86% of Gen Zers, you know, the, the, this generation that's really going to reshape how we do everything, say they only want to patronize brands that have shared values, including in environment and social responsibility. That is going to become more important as they get a, a greater power of the purse and they will this this responsibility to brands. They're, needs, gonna, they're gonna be like the lobbyists yeah, in business. Yeah, there needs to be a sense in whatever you're wearing. And Mark, you know, let me turn it to you. Do you know that your shirt actually costs about 3,000 liters of water to... I didn't know that. Uh, yes. No, no. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Anyway, tell us a little bit about, uh, in a way, a transition you had at Fortescue, because you come from one part, 20-year-old company roundabout, one part which is more mining, but green hydrogen is basically what seems to be now the core focus of your business. Tell us the how. Well, it's, it's uh, been an interesting journey and it continues. In fact, I was um, pleased to be here again. I, I came last year and uh, nice to be back. And a lot's happened in that year, I'd say. So we're, we, uh, we mine iron ore, 200 million tons, uh, one of the biggest iron ore miners in the world. And we've been on this journey of looking at how we take a, a very hard to abate sector and just go and do it uh, to get it decarbonized. So we made some commitments actually a few years ago to, to go 100%, um, no offsets, nothing, by 2030. So we lo looked around um, for, our, for the, our big trucks. We have these big trucks and big trains and big ships, and, and we talked to the OEMs, and they were like, well, yeah, we can give you something in 2040, which isn't very helpful for us. Uh, so we decided to do it ourselves, and that, that's kind of, I, I think, a big part of who Fortescue is. It's the culture about just, you know, have a go and, and see if you can do it. And so, you know, a year later since I was last here, we have now battery-operated haul trucks. These are massive, 250-ton haul trucks running around West Australian mines um, on batteries and hydrogen, which is fantastic. Um, our trains, we have the biggest trains in the world. They're four kilometers long. They, they take the iron ore to the coast, 40,000 tons. We've now got them on ammonia, uh, green ammonia and, and batteries. And, and the ships, which was kind of interesting because we talked to the shipping industry and they were like, well, you know, ammonia power ships you can, you can have in you know, 2040. So we, you know, again, we had a go and uh, we rolled the, the, the world's first ammonia ship, power ship into, into COP, which, was, uh, which was, went really well, actually. So I think, you know, part of the, the, the how is, is get that culture of have a go. And so decarbonizing a hard debate sector, and we're going to talk about the steel industry, um, you know, is the worst, one of the worst. And so the sec what drove us in the green hydrogen space was really when we looked at our scope three, we, our scope three, given we, we sell to the steel industry, is actually bigger than France. It's enormous. And so the way we have to change that is to change the nature of the product, iron ore into, into green iron, but also making sure that hydrogen is, green hydrogen is available. And when we had a look around, we came to the conclusion that the, the, the vested interest in the oil and gas industry just ain't gonna do it. And so we don't have a vested interest. And so, and I, I feel kind of, it's a shame really, because you know, if you have fossil fuel and you're trying to do this, yeah. it's a different compromise. So not being in that industry, and it just meant we could have a, a real good shot at it. And so we've, um, we, we, we're all in, we, our mission is to show the world you can have an alternative to fossil fuels. You have to do it with the oil and gas industry. We totally understand, but there is an alternative. And you've got to do it at scale to get those economies of scale. So we're developing green hydrogen all over the world. Um, and that's, you know, a year later, I kind of look back, uh, we're progressing very well. But I'd say, look, the, the important thing was having the, the culture right, um, that you have this attitude of just like, don't take no for an answer. You, you can go and do it and show the world you can do it. Um, and then, you know, having the mission that, you know, we can make a really big difference to the energy mix globally. 
because others really aren't going to do it. It's going to be too slow otherwise. Now, I love that because it really encapsulates exactly what you need to do if you want to change things. Yeah. You decide, you focus, you put your money where your mouth is, and then you see what alliances come along. And you cannot count on everybody, and I think this is what makes change you know, sometimes so, so difficult, and then to, to go it alone. And one of the hard truths that uh, Lorenzo was mentioning this morning is, of course, scaling. Yeah. And another thing is partnerships, and that is something that was also your success in Green Hydrogen. I think you have five different partnerships going, at least that was the latest uh, information I got. But tell us a little bit about really convincing all the stakeholders, because one thing is to, you know, drive change within your corporation. But then, unless you need, you need to be a sustainable business, first yeah. of all, before you can be a sustainable business in the green sense, and one feeds the other. Um, so so how, how was that process? How did you actually approach everybody with your, guys, we got to be number one, and please mention your impressive numbers of your turnaround yeah. as well in terms of turnover. Yeah, so look, I, I agree with Frederick. You've got to bring people along with you, and if people don't want to come along with you, they shouldn't be there. So, so, you know, I think on the, we're very lucky that we have uh, Andrew Forrest as our founding um, shareholder and he's our chairman. He's very driven if you've met him. So I think leadership is a massive part of that. And he's out there. So that, that, that really helps us actually. Um, and look, but I think we're in, a, we're in a brand new industry. So green hydrogen, there is no price. There is no market. There is no index. Yep. So it means you've got to go do everything. Um, which is quite, quite exciting in many ways, because you, you know, you've, you've, but bringing in the banks and the off-takers and the governments, um, it's hard. This is hard space. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but I think, I think generally it's the right thing to do. It, you know, we need to have that. We, we, you know, every day we emit emissions into the planet, we just make the place worse. Mm. So, so we have to find a, an alternative to fossil fuels. And green hydrogen is one of those, and we've got to do it at massive scale so that we can get the economies down to make it economic. So as being an early mover, we're not stupid. We're, we're, we're being very careful how we manage the projects we're doing. Uh, we believe they're economic. I have this debate with my chairman all the time about, um, you know, should we pre-sell before we, we buy, before we produce? And you, know, you have to because that's how you bring the banks along and the institutions. Yes. But, you know, his view is like, no, because once you have it, like Green Steel we talk about, there's going to be a ton of buyers out there. You know, so, so, look, I think it's, it's, it's just making sure we're very firm on the mission and, and um, you know, there's a lot of noise around this, ignoring the noise and plowing through. So that, that's kind of Absolutely. what we're doing. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think it's fascinating. And, and the entire, you know, transition to 2050, if I think about the cost, I think the last time a PwC study said 275 trillion US dollars are going to be needed in order to get to 2050 trillion dollars. Yeah. That's about a year, I think 8.8% of global GDP, 9.2 trillion dollars. Yeah. And when we talk about, yeah, it's difficult, mm. yeah, it's expensive, and yes, we have to make a viable business out of it, it's very easy to say that. But to actually be there on the ground, hands-on, and do it is another thing and make it viable. And if you then need investors, I come from the investor side. Yeah. So I'm listening to those people trying to pitch this stuff to me. And they promise me I'm going to make money. I'm like, seriously. Um, but talking about carbon, all that bad stuff you just mentioned, Mark, going out in the atmosphere, carbon recycling technology. Now, Jennifer, you join us from Lanzatech. Enlighten us a little bit what Lanza Tech really does. You're also quite a young company, coming up to about 20 years. You're also listed on the stock exchange, so you had to look for further funding. You went to the public market rather than to the private market. Who are you? What are you doing? <laughs> I like that. Who are you? <laughs> um, so what, what we do is we recycle carbon emissions, but also solid carbon. So we take gaseous carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen, and we convert it to ethanol via fermentation. So instead of using sugar uh, to make ethanol, we instead use these gases. Um, you can find these gases at industrial sites like steel mill, like ferro alloy, like refining. You can also make them from gasifying solid waste. So if you want to take all of that 
clothing that's just literally thrown away, you can recycle it back to ethanol and then take that ethanol and make things like polyester. So that, and, and we come at this from a belief that there's enough carbon locked above ground and waste resources to make the things we need and use so that we can get away from a linear economy of always extracting carbon from the ground to a circular economy where we use carbon over and over again. Um, to answer a couple of the other questions you asked, it's not science fiction. We have commercial plants running at steel mills and ferroalloy plants in China. We started a plant in India at a, at a refinery with Indian oil, and we started a plant in Ghent with ArcelorMittal. And this is a pair of H&M Move pants that was made from polyester. The polyester was made from our ethanol mm. that was, capped, was made in China. So you need to understand that this polyester, some of the carbon was gonna end up in our atmosphere as CO2 and particulates because the combustion of that carbon would have also resulted in particulates and dark skies. So instead, it's in a pair of pans. That doesn't mean you can throw this away. Mm -hmm. That means you eventually will take it and put it back in the cycle. Um, we've raised over $500 million of private capital through the history of our company before we became a commercial company. And then this past year, we went to the public market um, because we felt it was time to have the ability to show that carbon reuse could be done at scale and was relevant. We need to show that we can make money. We need to show that we can be successful at doing good. Um, because as you said earlier, it's not good enough to just be good. Yeah, absolutely. Dana, do you want to comment on it? Well, absolutely. The circular economy is the most important part of the fashion industry right now because it is still a very linear based company industry where they take they grow the cotton they make use the cotton and they throw the cotton away there have been several startups in the same idea who are trying to regenerate and and bring in the circular economy with the help of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on the Isle of Wight the former champion sailor and uh, one of them is called Worn Again, and they're doing this with polyester and cotton another one is called Evernew out of Seattle that's doing it with cotton. I write about both of them in my book, Fashionopolis. And, you know, this is, this is the future, that everything should be, uh, go back into the system and not just make, take, and throw away. There's a tag in my outfit that I just noticed today that says, please don't throw me away, please think of recycling me. And as I said before, we only recycle 1% of all fashion for the moment. We need to up that number. Circularity isn't going to solve all of fashion's ills, but it will certainly help, and it has room to grow, my goodness. So the mindset needs to be, whatever I produce new, I need to produce with a mindset that this is going to be part of a circular economy. So already Absolutely. from starting to produce, so my Lululemons will not one day end up in my glass of water because I have my micro uh, plastics in there. And this and is I where the, the legislation that we were going to talk about comes Thank into you. play. The EU is proposed 16 different <laughs> pieces of legislation, and one of them is about the waste framework. And a lot of these were test-driven in France, where I live, where basically fashion companies now cannot throw out extra stock. They can't just sort of make it disappear through shredding it or burning it or throwing it away or sending it to Africa. They can't. And so it's, it's, they did the same thing in the food industry, and it's been very successful because people came up with solutions of selling leftovers at restaurants at the end of the day or giving up to shelters. They're doing the same now in the fashion business. So what they're trying to do is slow down the overproduction and, and over consumption, but especially overproduction, that 20% that's produced and nothing happens to it, that it doesn't even get sold. Um, they're trying to shrink that. But they're also adding things like a digital ID, a digital passport to close. And this was actually championed by King Charles. Uh, uh, and the, there's a fashion task force at the King's Foundation, which is based at Dumfries House in Scotland. 
And King Charles led this. I was at the meeting where he's like, let's make this happen. And, and so you get a digital passport in your clothing now that you can scan and it tells you everything about your clothes. So then when it does go back into the system, it can be recycled properly because it tells, the digital passport tells the recyclers exactly what's in the garment. But you can also resell it and it, and it gives you the provenance and, and you know what's there. It's, and this will be in all garments soon in and Europe. And this is great and I guess that is blockchain enabled because without yes. that technology you cannot really trace Absolutely. Uh, anything um, from where it comes from and ownership. But Federic, I think you feel very passionate also about regulation, but you wanted to comment on the both ladies. Yeah, well, I just wanted to build on what you said, Jennifer, about ability to make money. It's very difficult to make money in those new fields, right? Uh, and I, I'm not sure in the mobility sector who really makes money selling electric cars or hybrids. And it has a management and leadership uh, impact. Uh, first, gaining scale is important, right? But second, um, <clears throat> focusing on the gross margin on the product and incentivizing leadership and people that are focused on those new technologies to make sure that the gross margin is high enough so that when you scale, it, it generates earnings per share in the company. And, and that's, that's tough. So, so when you're in this growth mode like this, which is 25% of Borg Warner's, uh, uh, let's say, uh, portion, right, uh, or total sales, it's very important also to adjust leadership metrics and KPIs and incentives to, to, the, to, to those business, to those business um, dynamics. And to your point, Frederick, absolutely. I mean, I think you have like a target of 15% of return of any investments mm -hmm. until 2025. And so that really means the business model needs to change. Yeah. Mark, you wanted to make a question? Yes, yeah, so, look, I, I would disagree a little bit on the, can you make money out of it, right? So we, we, we consume 700 million liters of diesel every year as a company. And so actually, when we thought about the decarbonization, it was like, we're getting rid of that forever, actually. So actually, we kind of, if you look at that light, it make, you know, we, can, we think it makes money by doing that. And, and one way to incentivize people was basically tell them, we're going to turn it off. So, you know, you, so, so the team really rallied behind it. And it wasn't in a negative way, it was in a very positive way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it, so. But look, it's tough. And I, I, I come back to the green hydro space or the steel industry. It's, it's a tough business mm -hmm. to, to fix. It's just huge. The scale is enormous. Yeah. But you have to do it. But let's, please, Jennifer. No, no, no. I, you're right. We have to do it. And I think the scale is actually something that we shouldn't let stop us, right? Because mm. once you start deploying, technologies get down the cost curve, and then they grow exponentially. They deploy exponentially, right? Because the more you deploy, the cheaper it gets. And I think what I think we struggle with is we question the economics while we're still getting down the cost curves. And that isn't the right question or the right answer, right? We have to say the early movers will help us get across the valley of death, and then it'll be a flywheel just like solar, just like phones, all of these things dramatically change the cost structure, but not from day one. So we just need to accept we're going to get there. It's interesting because in the fashion industry, the group Caring, which owns household names like Yves Saint Laurent and Alexander McQueen and Gucci, they have recently announced that they are decoupling profits and environmental goals that they're going to pursue the right thing in environmental goals. They are a leader in this area in the fashion industry and not use profit of how much money we're going to make doing this as the barometer of whether they should be doing this or not. They're going to do it because it's the right thing to do. And in the long run, of course, it will make money because it's a long game. And they're going to have to shift because of the legislation. There's one brand in the fashion industry, a very major brand that we all know and talk about regularly and hear about, that in the face of the, in, of the legislation has built into its budget for the next five years the fees it's going to pay for non-compliance. Because it's cheaper for them to pay the, the fines mm -hmm. than it is to change their business model mm -hmm. yeah. today. But caring is looking forward and saying, actually, in the long run, in 10 years, in 15 years, in 20 years, we're going to be in a better financial place because we, in, we did the right thing before it cost too much money because of the deadlines. 
and because we've, ba we've built this in, and so now it's part of our machine that's going forward. And they're, they're looking farther ahead than quarterly results. The other brands looking at quarterly results and saying, ah, we'll just, we'll just keep violating all these rules and laws and pay the fines. What? Go ahead. Talking, talking about regulation, there is something close to my heart, which is we need, all of us need to tell the politicians and the regulators to stay out of the how, stay out of which technology is the right one. They need to give us the framework of what they want and let us work on the technology that answers the, 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 the global issues. i give you an example. Take a city, whatever city, saying, I only want battery electric vehicle in my city in 2030. We have cities that have said that. Mm. <laughs> That's not exactly what they want. What they want is zero greenhouse emission within the four walls of the city. Mm. And there are plenty of other technology possibilities other than battery electric vehicle to meet that goal. So politicians, lawmakers, regulators need to tell us what they want, but not how they want it. That's very true for mobility. It might be very true for, for energy production also. But the, but the, the, regu sorry, the regulation is so important, right? I mean, we've come a long way in a year. IRA, Red3, you know, Australia, Japan. Yeah. So I think they play a role there, but carrot and stick, I, I agree with you. Let us, let us figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, oh, no, I will, he pointed at me, so I figured it. <laughs> um, we're, we're, um, the only comment I was going to make is legislation does need to be technology neutral, as you've said. It needs to create a level playing field. But the other thing about regulation is it cannot believe in unicorns that you know, poop fairy dust as they fly in the sky. Mm. And that is the real problem in my mind because new technologies, many of them can make an impact and some of them are the holy grail. If we only allow the holy grail, then we make no progress until that holy grail magic thing pops up. And we keep betting on holy grails, which means we keep slowing down progress. Mm -hmm. We need to take baby steps with the view of what the end game is going to be. And we are doing... It's interesting because in the fashion industry, uh, there have been a lot of innovations in biomaterials and biofabrication as a, uh, as a replacement for the fossil fuel-based materials, things that biodegrade, things that you know, don't have an impact like mycelium, which is a, mush a, a leather that's and, and many other materials that is based on, made of root systems from mushrooms, or bacteria dyes that you grow as much as you need and when it hits the earth, it just disintegrates, it doesn't you know, poison the earth. Or um, seaweed that's been turned into Lab fabric. Silk. I mean, there's fantastic technologies out there. There's, and, and, I've, and I've talked to these, these folks and the, the one thing they all keep saying is they're not getting the investment, to, they're not getting the orders to scale up that the brands will say, okay, we'll do a capsule collection of 100 mycelium bags, but you're not gonna keep a company afloat with 100 mycelium bags. You need hundreds of thousands of them. And one of the companies said, we need Zara and LVMH or Louis Vuitton to say, we're going with mycelium and right. we're gonna get rid of leather. And nobody's doing that yet. Yeah, it needs the champions. We're starting to run out of time, unfortunately. So let me just throw a couple of last questions at each one of you. Dana, let's start with you, fairly short. Mm. Um, so what gets you up in the morning if you think about what you're doing every day? And what really keeps you up at night if you look at what's happening in this energy transition in your particular sector? And that is for each of you. Mm. And you're the first one to answer, so well, you have the least gets, amount of time to think about it. What How gets me up in the morning is doing things like this where we can keep talking and, and spreading the message and trying to trigger and positive change to, to, to make the world a better and safer and cleaner place. And positive for humanity and planet both, that you have to solve things like poverty as well. To, to solve climate, you have to tackle poverty and that these go hand in hand. So mm. working together in, these, in this direction. At night, well, it's just so massive. Can we really do it? <laughs> of course, of course we will. Frederick. What makes me wake up every morning is to see team winning. Mm -hmm. I love to see team winning and I, leave, I love to, you know, see 
that leadership still has an impact. Uh, what make, wakes me up at night, you know, at Borg Warner, like everywhere else in the mobility sector and the powertrain sector, we're going to launch millions of pro products with new technology that has not been made before for hybrids, for mm. range extenders, mm. for battery electric vehicles, and we need to make those right. Mark? So, look, I think the mission uh, for us, you know, proving the world that, you know, uh, you can do stuff and you can do it quickly, and that really we can, we can get at the climate change um, with the technology we have now. So that's that I, every day, I love that. What, what keeps me awake at, at the, in the evening, I think, look, I, I think the scientists were right about climate change. What they were wrong about was the timing. Yeah. The timing's wrong. So we don't have until 2050 to figure this out. And I hear this you know, today, you know, so, you know if, if you've got a, a 2050 target for your decarb, you're basically saying it's not your problem, it's someone else's problem. And so we've got to make it our problem. And, and so, you know, until we do, uh, we're just going to muddle along uh, and then find out one day it's, you know, it's, it's too late. It's all too late. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer? Get up in the morning to keep trying to show what's possible, like you said, right? That there are ways to change how we source, how we convert, and how we dispose of carbon. I mean, I think that's what I care about and that's what our company cares about. What keeps me up at night is exactly like you said, we don't, we don't have time, we've run out of yeah. time. We, we're already seeing the impact of climate change and the impact of climate change on equity. <laughs> you know, our, our environmental issue is impacting the poorest and the ones that can least afford it. And um, we've got to do something very, very quickly about it. And I don't know how quickly we are really going. Mm. And so that does keep me up at night. Are we going fast enough? Mm. So speed and focus is important. And the understanding and the mindset that change is energizing. energizing. Thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you.